welcome to educators podcast a podcast dedicated to budding educators hi my name is swapnil i work as a intensive care specialist in sydney and in today's episode i am joined by social media master jc spur from the beautiful sunny queensland now this is perfect that after week brothers episode on branding i got jc here to share with us his secrets about creating an impressive social media profile as a medical educator welcome jc hi swapna thanks for having me first of all tell us the story behind your social handle that is injectable orange it sounds very mysterious to me so i guess injectable orange was um my first child um it was the accident and i've had a had um some further children with like simulcast and others that's how i tend to think about my social media um outlets um i love them all the same but the injectable orange concept really came from a throwback to the first type of simulation exposure that i had so i started the blog injectable orange about the same time i got on twitter in late 2012 um literally my first experience with simulation was injecting in learning how to inject into an orange that sounds so fascinating you are on almost every single social media platform maybe it's twitter linkedin instagram and also you are speaking at various conferences constantly throughout the year tell us how did you manage to go from a critical care nurse to a public speaker at this all key conferences I don't know if I've actually figured it out because it hasn't necessarily been that deliberate. I guess um, connections and friendships is probably the most honest answer. Um, there's definitely something to the uh, to the benefit of um, through presenting ideas and sharing ideas and thoughts through through blogs and podcasts. Uh, podcasts, I think, particularly can be a very good sort of show reel for conference organisers to. seek you out because they've got an idea about the sorts of things that you are interested in and speak on and they can also sort of see that you're able to carry a conversation or a dialogue or present an idea so maybe there's something in that um it hasn't been particularly deliberate it was a, i'd have to say a series of um saying yes to everything taking opportunities i was very keen, i've always been enjoyed presenting and um having a dialogue and discussion with audiences and um it, it's I, i guess just been a series of taking opportunities as they've arisen and uh building relationships and then going from there really i wish it was a more re- a clearer recipe to present to those that are interested but a lot of really good friends and um uh, i guess in the last few years particularly having an excellent mentor in Vic Brazel i agree with you that there is no set recipe for such success and you mentioned two important points there that having a network of friends and mentors is is really important because then that can help you to take your career as a medical educator to completely a next level yeah i agree the social media is more than just a fact of life now it has become an integral part of our professional and personal existence and almost has become the norm for healthcare professional educators However, we tend to dive in this world of social media without much knowledge and research. We often start with curiosity, then it becomes our hobby, and then it becomes almost a necessity. Now, we all are curious to know from you that how can we use social media to build our profile, especially in the field of medical education. I think there's some there's some good core principles involved there and that uh, like pretty much everything around education and um transfer of knowledge it's starting with why um it's always the question i ask people when they're going i want to want to start using uh, social media um i want to get a twitter profile or um or use instagram for to build my um build my brand or my personal brand in medical education or in Uh, research or use it for knowledge translation or a range of different ideas but having a clear idea as to why and I'd venture to say as well it has the answer to that really has to be more than 
I want to get more known. It has to be more than just promotion. Um, otherwise, I think you're going to struggle a little bit to build the connections and networks that are needed. Um, it, it, that's that concept of, I guess, connection and network versus broadcasting. Now, I do follow you on various social media like Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. Do you prefer one social media over other? I guess I've, I tend to partition my social media use a little bit in that um, Instagram I very much use for uh, my personal um, life, uh, like a photo blog of my personal life. And a way I like to think about my Instagram is almost like leaving breadcrumbs behind that as my kids get older, um, they'll see those snapshots of our life. So it's a, a think of it like a little bit of a personal blog. So I've, we have set up an Instagram account for Simulcast and starting to use that and particularly to share things like um, Ben Simon's infographics from our journal, monthly journal clubs and some, some of the more visual content, a bit of a track of where Vic, Ben and I are for different conferences and things like that. But Generally, I'd say for professional use, Twitter has been the main social networking pr- platform that I've used. I'd be really keen to make the distinction, though, between social media and social networking apps. Um, they are There's a lot of over, overlap in that it's social media is user-generated content, um, but social networking apps are one of a number of platforms, I guess, with that. Long answer... That's that's the long answer. The short answer is Twitter is the mainstay of, I guess, my professional networking use, um, and that was largely dictated by finding a community that was largely active on Twitter, um, and that was the community that I was interested in the conversations of. I agree with you that the Twitter has become the main professional platform for educators. However, I do notice that you are using the Instagram pretty skillfully to promote your educational activities. Can you please share how one should approach using the Instagram to create their profile as a medical educator? I think, I think again, it, it, rather than thinking about approaching a particular platform, I re- very much start with what do we want to share? What What is the engaging thing that we want to share? And if there's visual content um, like infographics, a, a really great example of, um, of Instagram use has been uh, my friend Salim Rezai has moved um, uh, Rebel EM content onto Instagram because he does a lot of visual abstracts um, and infographic summaries of different papers that they've appraised. Um, if you've got something visual to share, then that's a great way of going about it. Um, Then it becomes a little bit about understanding how uh, audiences outside of the people that follow you can find you on on any social media platform. Instagram and Twitter have the advantage of uh, hashtags, Um, so using hashtags that are commonly searched for or people might follow can expose your posts to a much bigger audience than just say the the fledgling group of people that um, you know that follow you when you get a new profile. Okay, I think you mentioned the very important point there that people need to find you. You might be putting out a very good quality content, but if nobody can find you, that's not going to be useful. And I noticed that you gave a presentation on use of hashtag can you please share those tips to our budding educators about using a hashtag yeah i I'd probably take a little step back and um just first and foremost uh give a brief defi- definition a working definition of what a hashtag is is essentially there's a number of social media platforms that use a hashtag format so that's the symbol hash followed by a word to, I guess, uh, categorize posts that are associated with that. And uh, and Twitter and Instagram allow you to follow a hashtag as well as follow individual accounts so you can uh, populate your feed with content from a hashtag that you follow. One of the most 
prominent in our, I guess, critical care, medical education um, area or health health professional education area is the FOMED hashtag, hashtag FOMED, um, which is the the, uh, the category of uh, used for tagging content related to free open access medical education, um, which started, I guess, with a whole range of blogs and podcasts, but has become um, fairly prolifically used in term, uh, in sharing anything that's um, uh, of interest to a critical care education, medical education community. Um, one of the things that we, became, a, a group of us were quite interested in, um, and we actually largely met through Twitter and the social media and critical care conference, was understanding the FOMED hashtag. We, we intuitively felt that it had some functions of a community of practice. Um, and so we saw an opportunity with a research competition, the Stanford MedEx Simpler Signals Research Challenge in 2015 to actually explore that to do some uh, deeper dive into the analytics and also use some uh, online ethnography methodology to try and understand the interactions that occur within the FOMED Twitter community. Um, and we were very fortunate to actually win the prize and subsequently publish a paper um, on that. and. Long story short is FOMED um, at that time uh, from our data set certainly exhibited uh, uh, the whole range of factors um, or domains and features of an uh, online community of practice. Um, to our knowledge, that was the first time that that was demonstrated uh, in a medical education um, hashtag and potentially in any Twitter community. Um, and was quite an interesting sort of launch pad to getting more involved in trying to understand social media um, and the interactions that take place in that. Sorry for a long answer to, a, again, a brief question, but I guess it's looking at um, a hashtag in itself is just a way of categorising content so that it is searchable by someone that doesn't necessarily know me or you. Um, we might post post a tweet um, a, and hashtag it MedEd, and then people that are interested in medical education can search can search for the MedEd hashtag, and they might not known of have known of Swapnil or Jesse before that, um, but they will find that tweet that we've made. Thanks, Jesse. That's such an important tip for all budding educators that use a proper hashtag. Because unless you use the appropriate hashtag, you are not going to get noticed and you won't be the part of bigger conversations. So all budding educators, make sure that you start using hashtags. And probably you can just simply start with hashtag made it and be a part of the conversation. Also, hashtag HMI educator is a very useful hashtag because all the HMI Harvard Messi educators are part of that conversation. And I like the idea that you kind of mentioned about the hashtag to consider it as a community of practice. And you have been doing some research around the use of social media in medical education. Can you please tell us your finding? And especially you mentioned that you use online ethnography to study this idea. I'm, we are all curious to know what are the findings of that research. I, I think whenever you're looking at uh, – we're, we're obviously bound by the time, uh, the slice of data that we looked at. So I'd acknowledge that that was in 2015, our data set there was, um, around the FOMED hashtag usage. It was a very large um, slice, of, uh, slice of data. We looked at a lot of tweets um, and ran them through a range of different uh, analytic engines um, to look at different features and how they mapped against a, the domains of an online community of practice. The, the concept, I guess, of, of what we learned from that is that the way that information and people were interacting was very much um, built around a common shared purpose, had strong social controls. Um, there wasn't a... There wasn't a 
an explicit set of rules, but the but where people, I guess, behaved outside of the normal social bounds of that community, they were regulated by other users of the community, which was definitely is definitely a feature of the community of practice. And they're through a bit of um, fancy manual following out of um, uh, of links. So we looked at the top one hundred linked. Um, posts that came out of the FOMED hashtag community and manually followed each of those posts out. We excluded from the data any that were, that didn't have a comment section, but then manually reviewed the comments um, sections on these and we were able to see evidence of transfer to practice. So there was a, an, say an article posted about an um, intubation technique. So that, that then in the comments section on that, that post, there was a discussion around, oh, yes, I tried this the other day. This didn't work. This did work. So there was some, some reasonably strong evidence of transfer to practice of the um, content and discussions that were happening in that community of practice, which we found really, really interesting to be able to uh, show and understand that. Thanks, Jesse. That's, again, very useful. Now, I really want to dive deeper into this Twitter analytics because most of the educators, they don't understand the Twitter analytics concepts. Often we go by how many likes you got or how many retweets you got. But I, I think there is more to that. I remember one of the presentations that you gave and you talked about how to find who is the most impact making educator. And you use the Twitter analytics to determine uh, the impact of an educator can you please tell more about that? Yeah, so I think I think what you're referring to is um, when you're looking at social network analysis is the concept of um, of network centrality. So that's a weighting that actually looks at users of a network or members of a network as being a node, and then maps connections between nodes. And as a, as information exchanges back and forth between those nodes, that that connection becomes increasingly weighted. Um, I'm hoping that doesn't sound too much like jargon, and I'm trying to distill that that sort of social network analysis concept down to uh, hopefully a visual 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 um, concept. But the idea is then, it, like using the example when we did our um, our research, so the slice of data at that time. Uh, Salim Rezai was uh, the had the highest network centrality weighting um, out of the FOMED community. So we jokingly shared that he was the centre of the FOMED universe. At the time, he certainly didn't have the most the most followers. Um, he wasn't tweeting a million tweets a day. But one of the things you could see on the network centrality map, the the visual representation of it, the graphical form was he had strong connections to lots of different subgroups within the FOMED community. And, and you can see that represented by, um, by two-way connections and, and strong nodal connections between, I guess, little satellites. So looking at there's a strong cluster around another node that sits out on the network centrality map and, and they'll have a connection back to Salim. And then there's, there's those hub and spokes that are connections all around. So it's a measure of dialogue and impact and sharing um, that's a little bit more sophisticated and looks at the, the strength of connection rather than the volume of audience. Again, this is a very fascinating concept. And I think you explained in a very simplified manner. Vic Brazil told us in the last episode that don't bother about Twitter followers. And now that makes sense that we should not be focusing on just a, a number of followers, but also think about our n nodal connections and network centrality. Can you please share some tips on improving uh, nodal connections? I think it really just comes back to connecting and it being a fairly uh, organic and natural connection with different different people. So, so using, I guess, for a medical education um, interest and enthusiast, it's thinking about there's the different 
aspects within medical education that you're interested in and engaging with, I guess, subgroups within that. So if you were deliberately, I, I'm loath, and maybe it's the Australian thing or uh, coming back to some of the stuff that Vic and you discussed around branding, I, I again would say I don't feel comfortable with the idea of pursuing um, a success as measured by a weighting of network centrality or the number of retweets or any sort of um, measure, success really would be defined by the reason that you wanted to engage in social media to start with. And I, I, there's a really an awesome sort of semi-humorous paper published uh, in, I think, 2014 by Neil Hall, which is the, called the Kardashian Index, and it measured the discrepancy between people's number of social media followers and their number of citations. So it was a, meant to draw a bit of attention at, to the, the gap between um, the self-promoters or the Dr. Oz style um, people within in healthcare and medicine and those that were doing, doing good work and, sh and sharing interesting work. Um, I think looking at how to, I'm more, much more interested in looking at how to engage with with people that you're interested in engaging with and then building in conversations around that. And that's largely, I think, what, what Salim says he does, um, and I'm sure, uh, and I know that he does as a friend, is shares really interesting, good quality content, tweets about interesting things, and then if someone retweets them or comments on them, he'll engage in a conversation about those things, so enter into discussion. Will also that they'll also be sharing into the subgroups of interest. So, using that as an example, um, there might be a, a tweet about something that's related to ECG, um, a particular ECG pattern um, in emergency medicine interest. So, like a common a common presentation, a, an a unusual ECG pattern in STEMI, for example, just plucking it out of the air. That may be shared within the FOMED. Um, hashtag group, and then uh, it may be shared by shared into a different group uh, uh, that's more of a cardiology interest, and it may be shared by um, the phone ed hashtag, so by a, a nursing interest group. So then that get that an initial tweet gets distributed out to different nodes in different sub communities or different different micro communities of practice, and that's how that is built. I like to work back to if you're starting off and trying to find people to have a conversation with and communities to be part part of, then it's thinking about what the parent area of interest is, in which case, in our case, let's say med ed, and, but then also thinking about the subdomain interest groups that may lie within that. So it might be presentation skills, it might be small group teaching, it might be procedural skill teaching, um, it may be simulation. So thinking of those as subgroups and then finding the conversations that are occurring around those subtopics and using presentation skills as an example, that's a segue outside of medical education um, that will broaden, that broaden the discussion much further because there'll be people from business and, um, and all other host of industries that are interested in presentation skills. So it unbounds the conversation around those niche interest areas, I guess. Again, there is a key message out there that don't just restrict yourself to medded world. Widen your horizons, reach out to the specialties outside medical education. As you mentioned, up for presentation skills, reach out to people in business world and, and just network with different communities. Now, if the budding educator wants to build a stunning social media profile like yours, what's the mantra? I think there's there's some good ways of thinking about this that have been um, popularized largely from marketing. So if we think of it, if we're wanting to build a community or in a marketing sense, a um, consumer group, but uh, let's let's think of it uh, in a little bit more of an altruistic and uh, knowledge orientated way. So let's look at it as the commodity that we're interested in is in knowledge translation, um, and the currency of that is is dialogue and sharing of of information. There's 
there are some ways to think about how to maximize our interactions and exposure. One of the one of the structures that I really like um, was, and Vic alluded to it briefly in your podcast, is was the book by um, Michael Hyatt, which is called Platform Get Noticed in a Noisy World. And it definitely comes from a business and marketing perspective. But the kind of crude concept of that, which was discussed in that episode, is having a home base, um, engaging in out. Uh, in outposts and um, having embassies as well. So if we think about that a little bit, thinking about what is the home base of Swapnop, for example, let, let's let's turn this on, turn this on the interviewer and um, say at, at the moment, what would you say your digital home base is that you would be tr- interested in steering people back to? That's so funny that you asked me that question because. Literally, I'm in the process of creating a home base for me. That is my new website. It's called www.critcareedu.com.au, where I got my all embassies coming together. Excellent. So a perfect example. And then if we take that step and think about um, embassies, if we think about embassies in the, as being not our home base, but a little bit, a little part of our home base that resides in different places on the internet. That then we look at in your in the case study of you. Um, it, that would be your Twitter account. That would that may be your podcast. That may be all these different ways that people can find you and then find their way back to the home base. Um, so that's that concept that uh, that Michael Hyatt. Um, sort of elaborates on is having strong at, strong embassies that are present in different communities or different platform areas. So having a presence in Twitter, having a presence in Instagram, having a presence in LinkedIn. If if there is a community that may be interested in dis- discussion and dialogue and and facilitate transfer to practice of the things that you're interested in. Wow, that's fascinating. I like your quote where you said your currency is dialogue and sharing. So all budding educators, make sure that you get this currency. Now, if someone wants to embark upon this journey of creating a home base and bringing their embassies together um, and, and then build upon the concept of network centrality, what are the cautions or warnings before they dwell into this exercise? I've got a bit of a framework for, for thinking about getting started in social media. And we've, we're in a little way, we've sort of jumped to the points uh, eight through to 10 of a 10 step sort of way of thinking about it. So I might rewind a little if um, uh, uh, just to give it a bit more of a, a concept around uh, that can help us avoid the pitfalls, but also help us to um, learn the lessons of others that have sort of trodden before in trying to dip a toe in the water or, or drink from the fire hoses as often explained of um, social media. So uh, we've kind of touched on it before. I think first thing is definitely knowing why you're interested in pursuing this. It, um, and I, I have to say it, it's quite, it can be alienating to engagement. If you're thinking about what your, like, what your currency is of dialogue and discussion and translation and building ideas it can be very alienating um if you are really aggressively pursuing a profile and to to broadcast or promote that will serve as a barrier to actually engaging in conversation just in the same way that if someone can if we met at a party and all you wanted to talk about was yourself i wouldn't be that interested in having further conversations i'm sure you're a fascinating person Swapnil, and i don't mean you personally but um but in terms of social interactions, we're still hardwired to respond in the same way that we do in a face-to-face situation. So I think knowing your why and being really clear about that will help you understand a whole range of things as you go through, like we're starting to search out um, a community and find the right platform to engage with that community. So it's interesting, I touched on the sort of concept that with injectable orange my first blog and and podcast it was 
an accident. It was really started with trying to just have a play around with a different format. Um, and I very much started just using it as a journaling of my own thoughts and in a way accidentally found people that that connected with. Um, Simulcast has been more deliberate to be a presence and help build a community around um, around clinician educators who use simulation. Um, so we've, we've started, I guess, with some of the accidental learnings um, that Vic and I have had over years of engagement in social media and social networks um, and built that a little more explicitly. So I think once you've once you know your why, it's then crafting your profile with authenticity around that why. And that's where I guess the concept of branding can come in a little bit like you and Vic talked about. But it's about essentially being true to the values of why you are interested in getting in. And that's that we demonstrate that through um, our bios on our profiles, the pics that we choose, the stuff that we share, the people that we follow. Um, and the manner in which we engage with people. So that the why really does flow through the values around that we display through how we write from when we set up a set up a profile in Twitter or Instagram or whatever else. Um, because when you follow someone um, and you're interested in engaging with them, the first thing they're going to look at you on is um, is the limited amount of information they can find out about you by clicking on your bio. Um, so I, I think that's that's just a a secondary step is thinking about that really carefully around when how you're trying to craft it. That will will come to the pitfalls and risks around um, those the bio as well in terms of represent who are you actually representing when you are on the internet um, on on social media. Um, then I think it's really just pursuing the concept of finding finding your community that you're interested in. So if you're interested in building up um, critical care education, you're, you're not going to just go and um, start interacting on Instagram just because it's a it's apparently the best platform to use right now. It's looking at who who are active in social media, who are the people that you want to actually engage with and have a dialogue with, and where do they hang out? What what pub do they go to? Um, and go and meet people where they already play. And I think this is one of the biggest downfalls in how organisations try and get their staff to use a organisation-approved type of social media or social networking application is the whole point is engaging with people where they already hang out. Um, so I would say that's that it, that the community and where they are interacting is the determinant of what social networking application or social media site you go to um, to try and build your initial connections. So the key messages for me are, first of all, ask yourself a question, why you want to use social media? The second one is dialogue and sharing is your currency and then find appropriate pub to use that currency. And what's your advice to budding educators? I think the thing very much around, because you did ask about the risks, I guess, of, of it, that when you're entering into the community, the big thing is just lurking and learning for a little while. The, the term lurk seems a bit pejorative, but I think it's a really good explanation of just watching without diving in and making comment too quickly, um, unless you've got something valuable to add to the conversation. Certainly leaping in with critique and criticism of someone's work is, um, again, thinking about how we build conversation, how we build relationships in person. It's it's quite alienating and unlikely to be successful if you just launch off with a critique of something that someone has said that you've just met online or you you don't know. So I think the con if we lurk and learn and pick up sort of what are the social norms of that community before we start to try and engage with them. For example, if you're if you're interested in sharing your own research and just jump into a new community um, 
at, of people that you've just followed or start using a hashtag and you just start broadcasting and promoting your own research without um, trying to generate a discussion around the o- objectives of your research, you're far less likely to be successful. Um, so it's that uh, lurking and learning, looking at how people engage and interact out of your community that you've found um, will go a long way to to helping you not, I guess, violate those those rules, um, the rules of the community, and um, and then become a more integral member of that community as well. Um, we still like to maintain those normal social social norms. So I, th- I think of those as the little R rules. They're the socially controlled rules of the community that you're in. And then the big R rules are the, um, uh, the rules around, say, your workplace, the, the, the explicit rules of your profession. So it might be the um, Australian Medical Association's guidance on social media use for doctors. Um, it, we, there's a publication on that. There's a publication on um, by the Australian College of Nursing on social media use for nurses. There's they're the ethics and codes um, of professional conduct around it, and I think that's a really important thing as healthcare practitioners to be aware of when we're entering into using social media, particularly when we're talking about clinical topics. I think there's a little less risk when we're talking about um, education uh, around things like simulation and medical education and academic work in that area, but it's still conscious of um, being aware of who you're representing and how you're representing. Um, And also the other thing is a lot of organisations, particularly government um, organisations, is it does violate the code of conduct to be um, uh, representing your place of work without authority to do so. So being very careful of distinguishing your personal social media use from being perceived as representing the opinions or values of your workplace. Thanks, Jesse. That's such a valuable advice. Now, the social media has this enormous potential to create an impressive profile, but at the same time, we need to be mindful about the consequences or the hazards that it brings with it. And I like the idea where you said that understand the social norms of the community before you start diving deeper because you need to understand the rules of the tribe in order to be part of the tribe. And then use the social media as a platform for interaction rather than for broadcasting. Now, if the budding educator wants to ask you some questions or want to reach out to you to understand this concept of network centrality uh, further in detail, what's your best contact details? The absolute easiest place to sort of find me is on Twitter um, and my handle there is at inject underscore orange. Um, That's probably the place the best place to sort of start, come and meet and have a chat. And um, it makes it very easy. Like Vic said in her episode is I definitely would not profess to know uh, everything about everything in this area. I'm an enthusiast rather than an expert, but I do know a lot of people that are experts in the area. So um, Twitter is a great way to connect and I can help connect you up to people that are experts in the area. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for your valuable time. I know you're very busy with your other initiatives such as Simulcast and Resus2. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And good luck for your new ventures. Awesome, you too. Thanks for listening to Educators Podcast. If you like what you just heard, I hope that you will pass along my web address that is www.critcareedu.com.au to your friends and colleagues. Also, you can Follow me on Twitter at reflect underscore learn or podcast underscore learn. So don't forget to join me in months time. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time.